We're on Genesis 2, Genesis chapter 2, 21 to 25. So, so the, the Lord God, God caused a deep, deep sleep, sleep to fall, fall upon the man. man. And, and when he slept, slept took, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. flesh. And, and the, the rib that, that the Lord God, God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and, and brought her to the man. man. Then the man, man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Shall she, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Lord God, we pray for this message to change our lives. Change, I pray for everyone who's not married and those that are to be impacted by your word today and what you have to teach us about marriage. Yes, Lord. And uh, Lord, I pray for a quickening in our spirit to receive, humility to receive. We come against the spirit of humanism and the God of this age, and we bow to the word of God. We submit ourselves to your authority, God, on this matter. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So that is a picture of the very first wedding. And we can learn quite a bit from, it's called the, the law of um, precedent or first order or something of that nature, if you want to be a theologian, I guess. <clears throat> it's the first time this occurs in the Bible. And um, uh, we, uh, we see the whole process here of marriage. Well, first of all, the man has to fall asleep in order to get married. He's got to be completely unaware of what's going on or he'll never get married. That was a joke. Sorry. I shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, Sherry's going to give me a hard time. <laughs> the man fell asleep. But what does that tell us about the process of finding a spouse? Did Adam go looking for a wife? No, he did not. God said, you, you know, just go to sleep. I'm going to do the work here. <laughs> and it was the work of, of the Lord that brought the first two people together in marriage. Now, the intimacy of marriage is so obvious in this uh, example that Adam was the first created being, human being. And then from Adam, God formed Eve. He didn't create a separate person out of the mud and, and breathing the spirit into. No, he took Adam, who was the image of God, and he created Eve out of Adam. So that's why we're told in the New Testament, Paul says that you love, it, you love your wife like you love your own flesh because you are one. And God said he joined them together. He took her apart and made a separate creature, but then he brought them together. So they still are one person. They're just in a different form. The rib itself wasn't something to love. The rib itself couldn't talk to Adam couldn't support him, couldn't help him. I mean, it's supporting his body, but the, he needed a person. He needed someone to talk to, someone to love, someone to have relationship with. And most importantly, as God said, he looked at Adam and Adam did not recognize his need. The man did not know that he needed a wife. And that may be true today too. Maybe men don't realize they need to get married. They, they want to date or whatever, but they don't know that they need a wife. And God said this, she's not just your wife. I mean, she's your helper. Adam needed a helper. And in this world, if we try to walk this out by ourselves, it is a disaster. You're relying on your own thoughts, your own feelings, your own emotions, your own plans, your own understanding. You try to do your own work and, and planning and all of that stuff. And when there's a crisis, are you going to just rely on yourself to worry and have anxiety and try to get through things? You know, there are times as uh, thank you, Tank, for your prayer. I really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. There were times when I was so sick, I couldn't do anything for myself. And Jennifer had to help me. She cooked for me. She prayed for me and, um, and bathed me. Um, oh, the horror. Uh, so um, the, the, uh, I, I need my helper. 
And, you know, there were things about raising our child that I couldn't do alone. There are things about the home I can't do alone. And, and, and therefore, uh, I would, and I would be lonely. When I thought I had COVID, I actually had Lyme disease and I was, they, they ostracized me up into the master bedroom and I couldn't leave for what, like 14 or 17 days. It was just hard. I, 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 it's a big master bedroom. I got plenty of space up there, but I was lonely. I was so lonely. And, uh, you know, maybe I'd call them once in a while to see what's going on out here. And, you know, uh, but if you, it, but if I had my whole life, if I, if I weren't married and all I had was myself, it would be extremely lonely and depressing. It's not healthy. And then, you know, whatever thought comes into my head, I think that's all that matters, right? But then, you know, you live with someone else, you have a family or a wife, and, and they have different opinions, and you, you can learn from each other and be aware that there's another perspective, you know, especially man and woman. So all of that is critical. And God saw the need in Adam and each one of us that we need that. We need each other. So, um, but young people, young people need to know this concept, Right now, marriage is looked at as a social contract. It's not necessarily looked at as God ordained. So you have all kinds of weird laws about marriage now. You don't even have to be a man and woman to get married in most places. Um, I believe you do have to be human. I think that that is still a requirement, but who knows, that could also change. Um, there used to be, you know, the, the age of the person mattered. Who knows what's going to happen in the future? Um you could, I, I've, I've read about people marrying themselves. I heard about this in Asia, that they marry, they have their own wedding with themselves. You see, co completely ungodly concepts. But God created marriage. Now, you can have a legal civil certificate that comes from the state that says legally the, the state recognizes the marriage. That's important, and that we have to obey the law, so we do need that. But God Cre the real significance of marriage is beyond that. And it, it comes from the Lord. It comes from what he has ordained as being important. So marriage is of God. And if you try to do it any other way, you're not going to be in the blessed status by the Lord. Marriage is not just a civil contract. It's not just a legal agreement that if you get divorced, there's a distribution of the assets and that sort of thing. There's a, there's a bringing together of two people spiritually under the, the governance of the Lord. Um, that's the way it's supposed to be. Now, those of you young people that are worried because you don't have your spouse right now, these are godly training moments. And, and the Bible says, don't rely upon your own understanding. Wait upon the Lord. Now, all of that means you need to know the word of God and you need to be waiting for him to, to introduce you to the right person. And you should be in prayer about this all the time. Don't do an Abraham and a Sarah where you're jumping out of the timing of God and you produce an um, a, uh, Ishmael. Wait for the timing. Don't panic. Don't worry. Don't hurry into the relationship. God will set things in place for you if you do it right, and you'll know. You'll know that person is right for you. Now, we had a great Bible study today, and um, also we heard uh, Tina's testimony about marriage. And I believe it's 1 Corinthians 7, but it, we're told, don't be unequally yoked to an unbeliever. I might have gotten that scripture uh, in the wrong place on that, but do not be unequally yoked to an unbeliever. Now, yoke in the Bible usually indicates marriage. It's this intimate union. So you don't want to marry someone who is not a born again believer. And don't be fooled because there's a lot of chaff out there that's going to look a little bit Christian or they're going to go along with that to win you over. And then you're going to get married and there's a spiritual union that occurs, even if they're not a believer. And the spiritual laws of authority within that family are still there. And we know uh, that the man is the head of the home. Now, 
uh, we, uh, uh, we're told in verse 24 of the verses we just read, therefore, I'm sorry, oh, it's uh, the unequally yoked verse was 2 Corinthians 6.14. Thank you. Let's go back to Genesis 2.24. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the, uh, so let's stop there. There is an authority transfer that's happening here. Until the husband or the wife leave the father's family, they are still under the father's authority. But once they're married... They become one flesh, and the authority isn't the father, the birth father, or the adopted father. It now becomes the husband in that home. But until the, the woman is married to the man, the father retains pr 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 predominant authority over her spiritual life, her life. And, um, but until she moves over, until she is actually married to that man, that transfer does not occur. There is, um, if you go to Exodus 22, Exodus 22, 16 to 17, this will give you an idea of what I'm talking about. Exodus 22, 16 to 17. If a man seduces a virgin who is not betrothed, that's kind of a long, prolonged engagement period, and lies with her, has sex with her, he shall give the bride price for her and make her his wife. If her father utterly refuses to give her to him, he shall pay money equal to the bride price for virgins. So in this, we see that the, the authority is for the father to give away the daughter to this other man. This is really critical because the authority comes from one father who's the father of all fathers and all families on down. The head of every man, every woman, the head of every man is Christ, who's a Christian, and the head of every woman is, is that man, is her husband. The authority, of, this is in the word of God. Now, you may have all of the humanism and social ideas coming from this world that go against that, and uh, you will suffer because of that, and so will your family. You've got to believe and obey the way God has structured his family. So now, if the husband, say the young people want to go away and get married, and they don't care about the father's input, they say, well, I want to get married. I'm in love. This is my choice, not his. And you call yourself a Christian. You're not, a, you're not applying the word of God, and you're, you're going to break the blessing. It is an opportunity for curse to come upon you. So you have to be very, very careful in this. Now, the problem we have in our society is many people do not have Christian parents, or they have divorced parents, or they've got malfunctioning parents. And therefore, uh, they think that they don't have to uh, uh, follow this law anymore. They've been corrupted. The whole situation has been corrupted. So they don't respect uh, the father. They don't respect the family authority. And uh, therefore, they're going to do what they want to do. Well, that's, uh, that's humanism. That's, uh, that is not relying upon God. We know that... Um, we know that uh, the Ten Commandments tell us very clearly that uh, there's a big issue here. Um, Exodus 20, verse 12, Exodus 20, verse 12, honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. And Paul repeats this in Ephesians, I think Ephesians 6, 1 to 3, somewhere around there. Uh, and he says, this is the first commandment with a promise. With, with a blessing that follows it if you adhere to it. So you don't want to run roughshod over the parental blessing, especially if it's a Christian parent. Uh, you don't want to just push them out of the way and say, this is all about me. It's not about you. The word honor means deep respect. Now, if a parent tells you to do something that's ungodly outside the word of God, you don't have to obey that. I think it's Acts 5.29 where... Um, 
we, we get that example where the, the apostles are told not to preach in the name of Jesus, and then they respond to the Sanhedrin, whom should we believe, God or man? But at other times, you see even Paul being very respectful to the Jewish authorities, even when he gets punched in the mouth, and he says, oh, I didn't know I was speaking to the high priest. So there's still a respect for God's authority, but when that authority tells you to do something ungodly, you don't have to do that. But now if the parents are giving advice, giving counsel to the couple that are going to get married, and it's biblically correct, you are under obligation to obey that or you will come under a curse. You, you will not receive the blessing. So you want, to, you want to draw back, take a deep breath, read the word of God, pray. And if you do that, you're going to cut out a lot of opportunities for the enemy to work maliciously in that relationship. Marriage has, in the best way, will, will work well if you start with the right foundation, the right godly foundation, obeying the hierarchy and the authority of God through the father, through the family, through the pastor, whatever. Um, and sometimes the pastor has to step in nowadays to help uh, counsel or bring that that training into people because they are not being led by parents who are following the word of God. Uh, you want to start off blessed in good relationship with the family. Weddings are not just about two people. And we learn this from the Jewish traditions. They are community events. The first uh, wedding that uh, the first uh, miracle that Jesus did in Cana was at a marriage feast. That's no accident. And everybody's there. Uh, the wine was flowing and the, and the, and the food was there. And, and, um, but you could see it was a large, if you look at the quantity of water that was turned in the wines, quite a, quite a bit of, um, uh, quite a number of people there. And it wasn't just, these were not just uh, Jesus's relatives, apparently. This was the community. And you need a witness. They, they form a witness. They form uh, a community support network. The families are involved. The father is involved. The father is blessing his daughter. And then there's also the bride price. I find this interesting as it's mentioned um, in, um, in that other verse in Exodus 22, 16. Um, uh, where there's a bride price for virgins. This also speaks to the spiritual significance. Remember, we are the bride of Christ as believers in Jesus. And our groom, our bridegroom is Jesus. Well, there is a bride price that he paid. He paid in blood. He paid with his life. The father, the father brings the bride again to Jesus just as he brought the bride to Adam. How does he bring the bride to his son, Jesus Christ? He brings him by the Holy Spirit. When Peter proclaimed for the first time that Jesus is the son of God, Jesus says to Peter, oh, you know, like, thank God, because you would not know this unless my father revealed it to you. The father is giving the blessing that says that Peter is part of the bride. When we come to Jesus in faith, the Father has called you and he's acknowledged that you are the right bride. You're part of the right bride for his son, Jesus. You didn't come by accident. He called you. He identified this is the right woman. Now, the, the Father has that discernment. A godly father will say, this is a good one. This is a bad one. Or let's go cautiously. Here's my counsel. The bride price the, the, the man would come to the father of the bride and pay an amount of money in order to marry the, the daughter. This, this is also apparent in, in legal consideration. It's called consideration when you talk about a contract, a legal contract. You, if you don't give me $1 and we say we have an agreement, then you can say this is a void contract. You have to have some kind of an exchange in, in your agreement. I don't want to get too far in this, but, but there has to be something given up of value to make a contract binding. And that's what's happening in your salvation with Jesus. And that's also what's happening in terms of a marriage. And But you'll notice that the, it is paid to the father of the bride because he has spiritual authority over her until she is given over to the husband. Don't, don't circumvent this. This is a big mistake. You're hearing the voice of Satan if you do that. And don't go too fast. 
Pray so that the Holy Spirit is actively speaking to you. Don't be fooled by false Christians. You don't want to be unequally yoked to an unbeliever because then you get into another set of lifelong problems. And um, the blessing that you would have had, it's not there. If you do everything right, you're going to avoid a lot of problems later on. Now, after the fall of man, uh, after Eve allowed the serpent to speak to her and she believed him and ate of the fruit and then sucked her husband into this crime as well. Um, God said he would put enmity, enmity between you and the woman, uh, the, the serpent and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. The offspring of the woman, of a godly woman, of a Christian woman, will be was used to uh, produce Jesus. And um, he was the one who would destroy Satan and the power of Satan over our lives. But also the other offspring, us, who are really Christians, we are part of that fruitfulness. When God said, be fruitful and multiply, he meant create Christians, create people in my image, and that we are at war with this satanic empire. So you want to produce you want to produce more Christians. You want to produce strong children that are Christians so that they can counteract Satan. They're part, we're all part of this battle. But if you don't come into a Christian union, both, both under the, the uh, covering of God, under Jesus, both committed to the word and to do things properly with proper spiritual authority, you cannot produce, it is unlikely you will produce these kinds of offspring that can stand up against Satan. You're going to have a confused relationship with confused children, uh, maybe confused beliefs, and that's not going to help anybody. You're also going to have conflict in your family and in your marriage. So you, if you're listening to God, you're going to minimize these things. Now, um, uh, he also says to the woman uh, in verse 16 of uh, Genesis 3, verse 16 of Genesis 3, God said to the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain, you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. Your job is to produce children. And there's pain and terror. I've, I've, you know, you watch a lady give birth. You can see that that's true. It can be painful. But it's also painful raising kids sometimes, you know, and to keep them from the way of the world and to try to fight off satanic influences and to try to keep your home a godly example. It's not easy. It's not easy. And, and that's what uh, the Lord points out here. He says, um, your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. What does that tell us? There is friction built into a marriage. The wife doesn't just do everything the husband says. Isn't that right, wife? Her desire is contrary to her husband's. We have friction. We have different opinions. And the husband, yet he has authority, but he has to try to bring in this contrary, uh, these differences into the marriage. The man has to be really godly. He's got to learn to become godly and, and really apply the, the, his walk with the Lord and the word of the Lord to the relationship because that wife is not always going to agree with you. There's always there's going to be difference of opinion, at least. But the interesting thing is the man shall have authority over her. Your desire, uh, uh, your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. He rules over you. You'll see that women will, will sometimes threaten their husbands and they want to leave, but then they get drawn back. Sometimes the husband's not very good, and yet the husband still rules over them. We were just talking on Friday about a woman we prayed for years ago who was abused by her husband, who's an elder in a, in a, in a Presbyterian church near here. He, he dislocated her shoulder. Uh, he hurt her back. We were praying for healing over her body because he physically abused her. Why did she keep going back and staying in that relationship? Because he ruled over her. He had the spiritual, there was a soul tie and God, God gives the authority to the husband. So even in that abusive relationship, she didn't want to leave. 
you see what you're getting into. Now, especially if you've got godly parents that say, hey, wait a minute, are you sure about this person? And you say, oh, yeah, wonderful, wonderful. And you're not checking with the Lord. You're just going by your flesh. You don't want it just to be sexual. You don't want it just to be an attraction. You don't want it only to be good conversation and friendship. Those are all important. But ultimately, is God blessing this? Is he speaking to you? Have you tested the relationship? Because marriage is the helper. Why do you need help in a marriage? Because life is tough. Life is difficult. Especially if you don't have a godly partner. If your partner is fearful, if your partner is lazy, if your partner is ignorant, selfish, um, doesn't have a passion for God, you are in big trouble. You're going to face huge trouble. And then you bring children into the equation. And it takes a lot to raise a godly child. Some people don't really invest much in it, and they don't get much out of it. Other people invest a lot in it, and the kid doesn't appreciate it anyway. Uh, there's going to be a challenge, but you got to do the right thing. Look at your partner. Is that someone that can recreate God's image in your children? Now, we're not perfect, but is there something there to work with? And here's something I learned. I think the greatest impact on children, and I'm not, you know, you, you, you want to set an example as a husband and a wife, parents, but we are also a work in progress, as I am. So, of course, I've made mistakes, and I've probably talked about it to you and other people. Uh, uh, but what I can tell you this after I got saved, the Lord enabled me to see my shortcomings, some I see more clearly than others. And he has given me a heart to repent. And um, I, of course, check with my family. I'm, I'm not finished yet. You know, God's not done with me. But on some very major issues, I've been able to change because I saw it and I repented. And um, my wife has done the same thing. Uh, now, that to me is the best I can do. Uh, repentance change. And even though the example I and my, my wife and I may not have been 100% perfect in raising our child, um, that sh alone should help. That sh alone should say, I've been married 33 years. Uh, my wife, uh, less than that, of course, but but just joking. Off. We've both been married 33 years. <laughs> just, <laughs> um, you know, that 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 is a period of growth, change, challenge, overcoming all kinds of problems, uh, you know, with each other and, and outside of marriage and with our child and everything else with ministry, especially good grief. So, um, uh, and that's not easy, but you stay together because God said, whatever he is doing together is one flesh. Let no man separate that. Are you ready when you get married to make that promise? Can, you know, people who want to, criticize me or point out my faults? Are you going to be married 33 years from now? Are you going to be able to say, I repented and changed and I listened to God? Are you going to say that you invested in your children to the best of your ability? Uh, you know, in First Timothy, we're told also that we are to provide for our family. And, and it says he who does not. So it's the man's ultimate responsibility. He who does not provide for his family is worse than an unbeliever. Um, are you going to be able to say that you worked and provided for your family and loved them at the same time? Are you going to be able to say that you did your best to spend time with them so that they could be, they could see a model, a Christian model? Or were you just working? It's, it's not good enough. Did, did you love people? Did you love your wife and your children and others? Did you set an example as a Christian? Did you care for the poor and the needy? Did you pray? Did you um, read your word? Did, the, did your kids see you reading your Bible at the table every day? What do they see in you? 
And now after that, hopefully we've produced godly offspring. Now you can't control the heart of your kid. You can only set an example, pray for them, and hope that they will uh, follow the Lord, the Lord. And then hopefully that they grow into husbands and wives that God will bless. But they may not. And if they haven't put themselves under the authority of a godly father, under the authority of God himself, uh, and they're not consuming the word and they're just doing whatever they want to do, you're going to get what you deserve. You're going to get a lesson. And it'll be big. And worst of all, you marry someone who's not truly born again. Now, Paul goes on, that is in 1 Corinthians 7, where he talks about the issues of the strain of marriage. And he says that um, if you have married an unbeliever, don't leave that person. Stay with them. And it's, the word says that they are sanctified through the, the, the uh, believing partner. And the children are sanctified. But if you read further on, it also says, don't assume that you will be able to lead your husband or wife into salvation. You don't know you will. So the sanctification is not salvation. They are not saved because they're married to you. If you're a believer, they are sanct. There's some kind of a holiness. There's some kind of separation that covers them through you. Um, but it is not salvation. Salvation comes from their own decision to follow the Lord. And you may be able to win them over. They're getting blessed by you, the believer. They may hate you, may curse you, may try to get you to stop going to church. What they're, Satan's trying to get them to do is to cut them completely off from the blessing that they get through you. You're helping them by remaining committed to the Lord. You're blessing your children and your husband or wife, and hopefully they will come to salvation because of the, uh, the, your example and your witness. Don't give up on God. That's the only hope they have, even if they're cursing you and telling you to give up on God. Now, the Bible also says that if an unbelieving spouse decides to leave the believing spouse, that you can let them go and you are free from them. So, I mean, this situation has come up a couple of times and people were kind of shocked when I said, well, if they want to go and you want to, you know, you want to be freed from this ungodly person who's causing you to drift from the Lord, then you can let them go. And they say, whoa, whoa, you know, no, no, you're, you're married all the time. No, you, you got two things that'll set you free from these ungodly people, sexual immorality. And if they decide to leave you and they're not saved then you're free. And maybe God's given you a gift of that, that person who's following a pagan religion says they want to leave. Or the adulterous spouse wants to leave, let them go. You, you could keep them, but let God give you wisdom in that. But you might be better off letting them go. Now, just because you have an argument and uh, there's tension and friction in the marriage, that's not, no, <laughs> nope. That's not a reason in guys, God's eyes to divorce or separate. You're stuck with that problem, and you better work it out. And the only way you're going to get it done is through prayer, and you set the godly example, and hopefully the spouse will come along. So you want to marry someone that can admit they, they're wrong. Don't, if you marry somebody who's stubborn and proud, it's going to be a tough one. And if you're both stubborn and proud... So you want to get to the point where you can recognize your weaknesses, your failures. You want to be able to talk about things. You want to be able to apply the word of God to each situation. And when you're wrong, go ahead and humble yourself, even if you're the father or the husband, and then demonstrate that you've changed. That's, re that's what that repentance will be. Um, Now, that Exodus 20, 12, honor your father and your mother, it means deep respect. We're told in, in Ephesians, let me take it a little differently here. Ephesians 5, 22 to 33. Let's uh, do verse 22. Wives, submit to your husbands, uh, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is 
the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Submit. Now, there's a submission to the authority of the Father. This is different from obedience. It's related, but it's different. Submission is an attitude. Obedience is an action. You're going you're gonna to do what you're told in obedience. Submission means you have a submissive attitude. Now, that's a big one. Because if you're not soft, if you're not humble, if you don't have the right attitude in the relationship where, well, he's my husband and he's telling me something godly, I'm going to submit to that. Or if the children, they don't have a submissive attitude. They're dishonoring the parents. Oh, whatever he says, I don't care. You know, I'm going to do what I want to do. It's my life. I can do what I want. Yeah, you can. And you'll pay the price for it. And you could kind of reluctantly do something. Well, that's okay. You never do anything that someone tells you, husband, wife, parents, that's ungodly. I said that. But a submissive attitude, submit yourselves to one another. We do this as Christians. We do it as pastor to flock. We do it to husband and wife. Submit yourself. Submissive attitude. Oh, I'm going to acknowledge that person. I'm going to respect them. I'm going to honor them in how I speak to them. If they're telling me to do something ungodly, I'm going to politely say something, politely address the situation, not rudely, not rebelliously. This is, a, this is an endemic to the United States of America. We were formed on rebellion. That's how the country started in revolution. And that independence and that selfishness uh, is bred into Americans in general. And uh, it's a curse. It's good and it's bad that we are strong people. We're, we're going to go out and we're going to make things happen. But at the same time, we can't, there's a problem in submission. That's why churches have so much trouble. That's why marriages have trouble. That's why parents have trouble with their children because they don't submit. There's no submissiveness. There's no humility. It's all about me. It's my decision. You can't tell me what to do. That's why people don't wear masks in this country when we know it'll stop the spread of the virus. You know, I'm, you can't tell me what to do. And therefore, you're never going to get the full blessing of God and it won't come into your own marriage or into your nation or into your church. Um. Now, this is interesting here. Uh, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 28. Well, Paul's talking about marriage further. Um, but if you do marry, you have not sinned. <laughs> and if a betrothed woman marries, that's a woman who's in, in the engagement period. And back in those days, it might have been a year, right? Um, it's as good as being married without sex. Uh, that's the betrothal period. Um marries, she has not sinned. Yet those who marry will have worldly troubles, and I would spare you that. Don't think marriage is just going to be one long honeymoon, baby. It's not. It's not. You're going to have trouble, worldly troubles. Everything, marriage is spiritual, but the working out, the day-to-day -day living of marriage is just worldly troubles. You're going to work. You're getting the kids ready. You're changing diapers. You're paying the bills. You hopefully, God willing, cleaning the house. Um, you know, you're, you're working through your differences of opinion. It's it's something, huh? It's something. And then kids who point at parents that might have had a deficiency here and there, they're gonna blame you for everything, mom and dad. You know. So I mean. They will rationalize and put every blame on the parent. That's wrong, young people. You've got to forgive your parents. You've got to honor them, even if they're not godly sometimes, if they made mistakes, because you want the blessing of God to flow down to you. Don't copy the ungodly things, but you can't blame them for everything and hate them. You got to forgive your father. You got to forgive your mother. 
You got to move on. You got to let the Lord heal you. You take responsibility for your own maturity in the Lord and your own growth. And you want to become that, that perfect model to the best of your ability with God's help as a future husband, as a future father, as a future mother. Don't keep looking back. Well, my daddy didn't do this and they didn't give me that. And they, that, you know, let it go. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. Be a godly son. Be a godly daughter. Pray for them. Pray for yourself, break the generational curses, break that ungodly mindset and model that you got from them, but don't hate them. They're just people. And then hopefully God will bless you. All right. And then we get down to uh, verse 39 in that same passage. A wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives. That's a long time, my beloved are you sure you want to get married? You could be if God directs that person to you. Otherwise, you've got a lot of problems. It's You're going through life with just, it says anxiety and problems and worldly grief and all these things. That's what you're in for. Don't idolize marriage. You can idolize a godly marriage, marrying a godly partner, if you're godly and that you're humble. And you have, as, as I think Tina said earlier today, you want to bring something into the marriage. It's not just taking. There's a lot more than just friendship in marriage, but that's a, that's a wonderful thing if you have it. This is no joke. This is the biggest. Now you get divorced and you are hosing up your children. I have never known a child, including myself, not to be harmed by a divorce and the process of divorce, getting there, the arguments, the division, the hatred, the anger. Um, and the kid is just a victim to you and your selfishness and your, your foolishness not to obey God from the beginning. And um, don't let alcoholism, don't let gambling get into this. Don't let fall, bad investments and bad spending habits and, um, you're harming your children. And if you're a minister and you're not focused on your family and you're just running around ministering all over the place, ministering at people, and you're not loving your family, you same effect, same problem. I, you know, I'm looking at, as some of us who are older in my age category, I'm 58 and a half. And uh, I'm looking back on a lot of things I did wrong and some things I did right. Um, but what I'm telling you right now, I thoroughly believe. I'm not just throwing junk at you. And um, my wife and I were not believers when we got married. And we had a lot of problems, <laughs> especially the first seven years, you know, but um, I think God, I, I was trying to figure this out the other night. Did God bring us together at that point as unbelievers? And we recognized that God was doing something, even though we didn't know him. Was that his plan? Or did he take two crazy people who didn't know him, but were eventually going to get saved? And we chose to get married. And he says, I'll work with that. I don't know. I don't know what happened, but I do know I'm married. And, uh, and I do know that we're both saved. And I do know that we're under the authority of God and we work to keep going into that authority, that we work through our differences, our failures. Look, I think I've mentioned this before, but T.D. Jake says, this is the only thing I can ever remember to quote him by, but it's not as important to marry the one you love. It's much more important to marry it's much more important to love the one you've married. And that takes a miracle. It takes the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, you have a marriage based on flesh. And flesh begins to rot and stink. Unless it's seasoned with salt. Unless it's seasoned by God and the Holy Ghost and the Word of God. I would not be the man I am today if it weren't for my wife. And I 
would hope she could say the same thing. Mm-hmm. And that process was two stones banging against each other sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> it's, been a, it's been a mixture of different things. But it, in the end, it's been valuable. Yeah. I would not be the man I am today without a child teaching me about the heart of the father. Mm-hmm. These things are tough. And sometimes disappointing and difficult, but you learn godly things if you submit yourself and, and, and are willing to learn. All right. All right. All right. All right. All right. There's much to say about marriage. Let's take this uh, to the end here. So we go to Revelation 19. And in this, we started the Bible with a marriage in in the garden between Adam and Eve. And the Bible ends in the book of Revelation with a marriage between Jesus and his bride, the church. And there's, if you go to verse six uh, of 19, Revelation 19, verse six, it talks about the marriage supper of the lamb. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder crying out. Hallelujah for the Lord, our God, the almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exalt and give him the glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. This is why God's so adamant about the sanctity of marriage. He created it and he had a modeling purpose to show what it's like for his son and us to come together at the end of days when he comes back and we move past the betrothal, the engagement period, which is a time of testing of loyalty and fidelity. Are we serious about this relationship of Jesus until we get to the marriage supper? You are not married to Jesus right now. You are betrothed to him. You are engaged to him. And that engagement can be broken for infidelity or unbelief. Same as for the uh, uh, natural marriage, like I talked about earlier. So you got to stay there all the way up until the marriage supper. And that is a time of joyful, wonderful celebration and love. And it's not just about laws and religion. It's about relationship. It's about the joy. It's the celebration of the wedding. It's dancing. It's a little wine at that point. I guess we can drink wine at that point. We probably don't get drunk and we can have a party and we can have the fatty meats and we're going to have a party. It's a party and everybody who made it is invited and the family of God is there dancing and the music's playing and the sun is so, he's so happy it was all worth the bridal price and the sacrifice and i got you all together and we're happy we're joyful and we all held together we held on to the bride we and the bride and the groom held on to each other and he's going to pull out the book of song of solomon's and we're going to see that rapturous love and the intensity and the passion and the romance that god has for his bride and that's another part of marriage it's not just about all of the heartache and the trouble and the work it's also, you got to have a passion and a love for one another that we see in the Song of Solomon. And that has to be part of your walk. And God sees it that way too. On my bed, uh, on my bed, by night I sought him whom my soul loves. I sought him, but found him not. She's grieving. I want my husband. I want my lover. Oh, and Song Solomon 4 1 Behold, you are beautiful, my love. Behold, you are beautiful. Your eyes are doves behind your veil. Your hair is like a flock of goats leaking, leaping down the slopes of Gilead. You are hot. You are beautiful. You gotta have. I was the minute I saw my wife, I thought, wow. <laughs> I mean it. I, was a, I have never seen a more beautiful woman in my life. That's the truth. And then, and then I introduced her to some people, that other officers in the military. And I remember this one woman looking at her and said, you're so beautiful. 
I couldn't believe she said that, you know, like another woman's complimenting my, but anyway, she is beautiful. And, and if you don't feel that way about your bride, there's something wrong. You're going to miss out on something. And she's still beautiful. She's still wonderfully beautiful. Wow. So you got to do that too. And he's got to be that handsome man. Now your eye is going to be different. You're going to see someone differently than I see it. I mean, she was beautiful to me. I don't know what your cup of tea is, uh, but, um, but that's exactly what I was looking for physically. So there's a drawing, there's a passion that comes in that relationship and you got to feel that. Now I may look at your bride and I may not go, wow. You know, I might say, hmm, <laughs> but you might say you're good, but you have to say, wow, she's hot, man. I love, Ooh, wow. You know, so you got to have that in there too. And Jesus has it for his bride. So, wow, you're awesome. Now we don't look so awesome right now in this process in the betrothal period that I can see, but he's saying something completely different about this bride of Christ, man. I'm always the one saying, why is the church looking like this? You know, why do I look like this? But he sees something different. He's looking at what this bride's going to look like at the marriage supper. He, that she's going to be a gorgeous to him. So he sees that. And you got to see that too in your partner. Mm. And pray to God. He'll give you that. He'll help your eyes see that beautiful person. And passion and love and then commitment. Marriage is commitment. It's all about honor and respect. And that starts with the parents, of the, of, especially of the bride. So you got to hold this right from the foundation all the way through to the end. It's in our human marriage. It's also our spiritual marriage to Jesus. Don't cheat either one. And the laws of God apply, and they're not going to stop, and you're going to pay a price if you don't do it the right way. All right, guys. I want to pray for those getting married, those who are married, those who will be married. Some people may not get married. There's, that's another teaching altogether. Paul says, you know, if you're, you can remain single, but if you do that, it really has to be from the Lord. You don't want to do that. If, and and it, you have to be committed to God. Live your life as if you are married to the Lord. Don't just say, I'm going to be single and selfish. Uh, that's not, nah. He's talking about a spiritual relationship with God to replace the physical aspects of marriage. All right. Oh, it's also better to get married if you're sexually desirous. Uh, you know, you want to, you need to have sex and uh, well, then get married. Don't, don't have sex out of wedlock. You're going to bring all kinds of problems and we have to break curses off of each other. Okay. All right. We can talk more about this later. <laughs> Call me if you have questions. All right. Lord Jesus, we thank you, God. We thank you for this marriage paradigm that is at the beginning and the end of the word of God. And we even see the first time, Lord, when you come forth and do a miracle at the wedding in Cana. So, God, we know this is really something you put at a, the highest of priorities. And we thank you, Father. We thank you, Father, that you brought us as a bride to our groom, Jesus. And Lord, we pray for that model to play out through the work of the Holy Spirit, not just in our relationship with you, Jesus, although that's the most important. I also pray it is true for each uh, young man and woman, especially the unmarried ones, that they are going to trust you. They're going to pray. They're going to be led by the Holy Spirit into a, into a godly union that they won't fall for the tricks of Satan and just seek a social contract or a humanism, civil relationship, civilly legal. I mean, but they're looking for the blessing and that they will honor godly parents. They will honor the word of God. They will honor you and that they will take time. They will be patient. They will seek revelation for that partner. And Lord, I pray blessings over the young people that they exercise godly discernment and that they will recognize the right one for them, that they won't act foolishly or impudently or impatiently, that they recognize when they say they want to get married, they recognize the heavy weight. There is a joy and there is a burden. There is a necessity and there is there are positive outcomes of a godly marriage, but there are also strains, stresses, challenges. 
and requirements to make it fruitful and godly and prosperous and joyful. And Lord, I pray that, I pray that over my daughter as she's contemplating uh, marriage here and, and Alex and for all the young people. I know Julie has a, a friend. Um, so Lord, I'm praying for her and Anthony uh, that they'll also come to know this and follow this. And I pray, I'm going to say your names, okay? Fook and Timmy and Brian and Tang and uh, Michaela and Alex and who? Victor. And Victor. And uh, Edwin. Edwin. Yeah. And Kenya and me. If I miss anybody, yell your name out. I bless all of you. I bless you. I want you to have a godly partner. Yes, sir. Thank you, Lord. And I, I pray wisdom and discernment. I pray the love of God is in your marriage, in your relationships. I pray for you to become godly husbands and wives and, and godly parents according to God's model. And I pray healing in the current marriages. Maybe some of us or maybe all of us didn't follow these rules when we got married and we're paying a price for it right now. <laughs> but Lord, uh, there's, still, there's still good things that'll come out of our uh, faithfulness in our marriage and to you. And um, you can work with us in our, in our hobbled states. Um, Lord, we pray for the unsaved uh, husbands and wives or backsliding or, or not um, those that are not passionate, uh, as passionate as we are or as committed. We pray for their transformation to love you first and also forgiveness in our marriages from our mistakes. And uh, also pray for repentance and, and that walk of repentance for those that have made mistakes that we are now living a holy and godly life, that we're loving our partner, that we're honoring them, and that the authority of the man, that, that the man takes uh, a godly responsibility as the teacher and the leader and the, the covering and the provider. We pray that all the men grow into that so that their wives can honor and respect them and that they have a reason to submit and to follow them. I pray blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Lord God, thank you. Uh, Lord, we thank you, too, that you're forgiving and you're gracious. And for those of us that didn't have marriages that worked out, um, as we come to you, we repent, confess, and mainly we just want to be first uh, faithful to you, God, and we pray for anybody else who... Uh, is in need of a partner, uh, uh, we pray, God, that you uh, bring them to them and bring them peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.